OK, so um, I'm just going to go ahead and skip all the review and what we did yesterday and blah, blah, blah. Let's see, well, OK, at least I got to set up the context. We have started now the, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? The conflict between Jesus and the religious leaders. And yesterday I said, OK, let's have a little bit of mercy for the Pharisees, right? Because maybe at best they want to know who is this Jesus guy why should we let him teach our people? What if the guy's blaspheming or whatever? But we're not going to have much sympathy for them because in the end, they're really basically a bunch of prideful, power-hungry people, right? But they are now going after Jesus and they're questioning him because he's not living up to their standards of righteousness. And as we're going to find out, in fact, I think I'll get there sooner than later, um, they've made up a bunch of rules that aren't even in the law, but they've added two. So one time I went and I found um, some ancient Shabbat laws from the rabbis that aren't found in Leviticus. But this is what happens when you have religious rules from God and then you set people loose with them. Oh, by the way, you know where that gets started? It actually gets started in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> Satan's the first one to add to God's rules. Okay, what was the only rule in Eden? Okay, very good. One rule. By the way, do you ever think about how easy that was to been? I mean, think about all the stuff we can and can't do, right? We're always going, am I allowed to do this? Is this sin? Did I gossip? We're, we got all these millions of things. We only had one thing. One thing. Don't eat from that stupid tree, all right? Okay, I guess it's not a stupid tree if it's the tree of knowledge, <laughs> right? Okay, so think about it. So what does Satan come in and say? And Satan says, did God really say you couldn't eat from any tree? Look what he did right there. He took one rule and he made it into like a thousand rules. It's legalism, right? It's taking like the basic commands of God and adding to it. It's like the first lie. There it is. But this, this is some of the laws that by the time Jesus was walking around on the Shabbat, you cannot carry a load heavier than a fig. Have you ever seen a fig? They don't weigh much, right? Um, but by the way, if an object weighed less than half of a fig, you could carry it twice. Apparently that was like a thing, right? Yeah? Um, you could not wear false teeth because false teeth would be like you were carrying a burden. Um, you could not throw an object in the air and catch it with the other hand. That would be working on the Shabbat. Um, you could not take a bath because you might accidentally spill water on the floor and that would be washing the floor. Um, a woman was not allowed to look into a mirror on the Shabbat unless she might see a gray hair and be tempted to pluck it out. That would be working on the Sabbath. You could not travel farther than 3,000 feet from your house unless you were going to get some of your food, which was considered to be part of your house. So then you could go, you were allowed to go another 3,000 feet. But you could only get one fig at a time? Yes. But if you, but if you tied a rope across the street, you could extend your house that far, then you could go across the street. So some villages would put a rope around their entire village, and that would allow people to walk around the village, right? In addition, you could not sow, you could not plow, you could not reap, you could not grind, you could not thresh, you could not shear, you could not bake. I even added here, or make fish tacos, but I don't know if that was a thing back then. I don't know. Isn't that weird? Just this weird, weird stuff that these guys came up with. So this is the environment now that Jesus shows up, okay? So let me, uh, let's pick up the story. Um, yeah, chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. Let me just read my notes here. Um, so the, the Sabbath had morphed from a commandment to become sort of a part of Jewish identity that was very particular to these people at this time in history. So the Shabbat had sort of become, right along with dietary concerns and circumcision, something that was unique to the Jews. And to the Pharisees and the religious leaders, it wasn't just an issue of legalism, but it's where they got their power and their authority from, their ability to sort of enforce these laws of things you could and could not do on the Shabbat. Everybody knows when I say Shabbat, I mean Sabbath, right? Same thing, right? Okay. So chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. 
One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands and eat the kernels. And some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Okay, well, first of all, it wasn't illegal, right? Farmers were obliged to let travelers and poor people eat from the edges of their field. And it's not blasphemy because they're not actually harvesting anything. They're just sort of feeding themselves. This is sort of a classic example of the Pharisees are nitpicking. And of course, when you nitpick Jesus, it's probably not going to go well for you because remember, you'd never get involved in a land war in Asia, according to what movie? Princess Bride, and never get into an argument or a debate with Jesus. So look what Jesus answers, verse 3. Jesus answered them, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? Can we just stop right there? Did you see what Jesus did right there? He's like, haven't you read the Bible? <laughs> and think who he's talking to, right? These are the major philosopher, theologians, Bible experts, right, of the time. And Jesus is like, did you guys know your Bibles? Okay. But David entered the house of God, taking the consecrated bread. He ate what is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. And then Jesus said to them, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. So what's going on here? Okay, first of all, he's talking about David. Uh, this goes back um, to the time of David, obviously. When they used to put 12 loaves out, remember they called it the show bread or the bread of the presence. At the end of every week, they put new 12 new uh, loaves out and the priests could eat the old stuff. But David guys were hungry, fresh from the battle. And so it's an interesting teaching here about what's important. And we're going to see it in the next story. Is the rule as important as human need? Um, but it also displays perhaps a little bit here about Jesus and the priesthood of all believers, right? Because remember, under the new covenant with Jesus, who is the priesthood? All of us. All of us, right? We are the new priesthood, right? We no longer need priests to do um, these specific ceremonies for us to be able to communicate with God. Now, David is obviously also kind of a transcendent character um, that is a prototype of Jesus. He's the prototype of the Messiah. And um, Jesus then says that he is, the Son of Man, is Lord of the Sabbath. Now, this is probably what freaked them out more than the fact that they were eating grain from the side of the grain fields right here. But Jesus is basically calling himself greater than the law. The Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. And he is now going to explain sort of the whole plot behind the Shabbat for them. So let's just keep the story moving. Verse 6. On another Sabbath, so it's a different Sabbath, but it's still the Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and he was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Okay, a couple things I find interesting about this little thing right here. Notice that it's already assumed he has the ability to heal, right? Now, let's, can we just pause there for a second? Like, think about that. There's a guy there, and he's got a shriveled hand. So let's just pretend my hand shriveled right there. And everybody knows his hand is shriveled. Everybody knows he can't use his hand. Maybe he's got some kind of palsy or I, we don't know what, right? Isn't it crazy? Like these guys already have enough faith. They already have enough belief in what they've seen of Jesus that they're like, all right, Jesus can heal this guy. It's pretty crazy to think about. Like they already, I mean, imagine if there was some dude that you knew well enough to know that if you broke your arm, where's <laughs> Trent? Trent gets injured yet again, right? And there's this dude, and everybody here knows when homie shows up, oh, this guy could totally heal Trent's elbow. That's kind of saying a lot right there, right? But here's what's crazy. What these guys are looking at is will he do it correctly according to our religious tradition? Look at what they've done. Look how high they've placed this idea of what we call legalism, obeying the rules, 
sticking by the religious regulations. It has already replaced poor Trent's elbow. Does that make sense? Yeah? And so they're already there trying to assume, what, uh, they're already there to see if he's going to be legally correct. So now remember, I've been teaching you guys this for weeks now. It's not the miracles themselves that are the issue. What do the miracles always point to? The message, who he is, and what he's saying, okay? And that is what's going on in the context of this story. Who does this guy think he is if he's going to go healing people on the Shabbat? Therefore, Jesus is going to push the envelope here because it's interesting. This guy's infirmity, it's not life-threatening, right? This guy is not going to die if Jesus doesn't heal him today. Why doesn't Jesus just wait until tomorrow? Well, the reason why is he's going to make a point here. He's going to make a point right here. So before first, Jesus, of course, let's have some fun with it, he says. Let's, um, let's quiz these guys. Verse 8. But Jesus knew what they were thinking. Yeah, that's kind of cool right there. Hey, Keith. Hey, you guys. Jesus already knows what they're thinking. He knows that they're sitting there waiting to accuse him about breaking the Shabbat, right? So he goes, Jesus knew what they were thinking. And he said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand in front of everybody. So poor guy's got to stand up and stand in front of everybody. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, what is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or destroy it? So now in the book of Matthew, um, in this same episode, he proposes, Jesus says, if a, if a farmer has his sheep fall into a pit, would you not allow them to pull the sheep out of the pit? And everybody recognizes, yeah, that's probably true. If your sheep falls into a pit on the Shabbat, it's probably legitimate to pull your sheep out of a pit. And his question is, how much more valuable is a human? And then also look at this other little subtle implication here. Um, to not do good when is possible is the same as doing evil. Isn't that interesting? If you have an opportunity to do good, to save a life, if you have an opportunity to help somebody, and I just realized you guys have name tags in front of you. That's so nice. Trent and Lily and Faith. Yeah, Kate have theirs. That's so nice, Colby. But I don't need them anymore. Is that how you spell your name? Yeah. Kilam? I had no idea. Okay. So not to do as good as evil. It's always better to do good and save lives. So look what happens. Nobody's going to answer. So he looked around at them all, and he said to the man, so obviously nobody answers, <laughs> which probably was the smartest thing they did, maybe the only smart thing they did in this whole day right here. Is it lawful to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy? Nobody answers anything. And he looks around at all of them, and he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored and I love this part. Not love this part, but look what happens here. But they were furious, and they began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. You should underline that in your Bible, what they might do to Jesus. So first of all, Jesus heals. Let's, can we just pause for a second here? Don't miss how miraculous this is. Everybody knew this guy's hand was shriveled for real. Nobody's calling fake, you know, fake magic or nothing. He heals. But not surprisingly, the fact that he heals this guy makes him more dangerous to the Pharisees. Why? Because it's not the miracle, it's what the miracle points to. And the miracle is pointing to the truth of what Jesus is saying. This means that Jesus is likely correct when he says it's okay to heal a man's hand on the Shabbat, right? So the discussion is no longer what is this guy claiming and what is our verdict? But the verdict is clear. They need to get rid of Jesus. Jesus is dangerous. He's a threat to their authority. He's a threat to the way they're used to doing things, you know. He's a threat to legalism and he's a threat to religious tradition. And so no longer are they wondering, what, like, how do we take this guy? How should we perceive this guy? What is the answer to the question, who is this guy? They have already decided, okay? So they now are already thinking about what are we going to do about this guy? So that's all for the verses we have to teach today. So I've got just a couple quick 
applications. And first of all, I want to talk briefly about the Sabbath. Um, the Sabbath is for man. Look what Jesus says in Mark chapter 2, verse 27. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And I love this idea. Um, at the end of six days of creating, it says God rested. But from everything you've learned about God, especially from Hugh Ross, was God tired? <laughs> Did God really need a day off? Poor guy needed to put his feet up and watch football, you know? No. The original intent of the Sabbath, and by the way, what I'm about to tell you right now is a very short summary based on a couple nights of long, hour-long teachings about the Sabbath, which is basically everything I could figure out about the Sabbath, and I taught it over a period of two nights, and now for your benefit, <laughs> I'm going to narrow it down into like one sentence. Is that, aren't you like excited about that? Okay. Woo. Okay. The Shabbat was a day of rest for men and women to have a break from a week of working. Okay, number one, it was a day of rest for mankind that we weren't, we're not expected to work seven days a week. Now, it's kind of cool. Some people get two days off a week, right? I only take one, but that's another story. I also get to arrange my own schedule, so it's a pretty chill week. All right. One, it's a day of rest from your toil. But number two, it was intentional that you were to spend that time hanging out with your family. And not just your immediate family, but also your church family. Now, I say church at the time. Of course, it meant you went to the synagogue. It meant that you hung out with other Jews, right? Number three, you were to celebrate the blessings that God had bestowed upon you. So you were to discuss all the things God has done for you. Now, back in the Old Testament, they quite literally would gather around and they would tell stories about how they were set free from their slavery in Egypt, where it's likely they maybe never got a day off. Isn't that an interesting concept? Don't know that for sure. That's just speculation. But it's possible the Egyptians never gave them a day off. And so they have one day of the week where they get to not do toil. And by the way, oh, I, I'll tell you a good story about this right now, right? Um, I got, I don't know if I ever shared this with you. I don't think I have shared it with you. But I got to do a Shabbat dinner with a family in Jerusalem in 2018. And it was really cool. So here's what happened. We'd been down cruising in the desert that day. We went and did, we floated in the Dead Sea. We hiked up to uh, Masada. We hiked up to En Gedi. And we end our day in like a suburb of Jerusalem. And we get invited to have a, Shab a traditional Shabbat dinner with a Jewish family. And here's what's cool. At, right at sunset, because you know Shabbat starts at Friday at sundown, right? I think you all know that. Maybe you don't know that. Friday at sundown is the official beginning of the Sabbath. Because Sabbath is Sabado means what? <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> right. So... A little horn blows. That's the official, the kickoff of the Shabbat. And at that time, it's really cool. The dad of the family goes around and he collects everybody's cell phone, collects everybody's iPad, and he collects everybody's, um, what do you call, PlayStation controllers. And he locks them up in a special cabinet called the Shabbat cabinet. And he locks it up. And then all the kids... They run outside to guess what? To go play in the street. You know why? There's no traffic. Because if you go driving down somebody's street during Shabbat, people throw rocks at your car. <laughs> Is that cool or what? Yeah? And I was looking around right at that point going, wow. This is kind of cool, actually. The phone, oh, the TV cable cord gets put away too. No TV, no cell phone, yeah? no video games. No distractions. Mom has spent the day cooking. Are you ready for this? So at sundown, all cooking stops, and she's put away food to eat tomorrow. So there'll be no cooking. There'll be no cleaning. There'll be no working. There'll be no distractions. And then the, the kids come in at a certain point. They come in, and we all sit down around a table, and the dad walks us through this ritual, which I'm going to forget now. But basically, he talks about how awesome it is that, that they had been rescued from Egypt. He talks briefly about the Passover and this and that. And then there's a series of blessings. 
where the father thanks God for all God's blessings, and then the father pronounces blessings on each one of his children and everybody at the table, including his wife. And then we eat dinner, and we all goof around um, and talk story. And I'm like, you know, this is kind of cool. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I rarely get together and sit down with my family to have a meal. Now, everybody's so busy, busy, busy. We're always off doing stuff and going here and going there. Um, I don't know about your family. I was blessed I wasn't raised in this kind of household. Um, but I was just visiting, uh, where was I? Oh, I just had dinner at a friend's house on Friday night. And it was one of those households where I was invited over for dinner and with a few other people. And the whole time, from the time I got there during the preparation of the dinner, in the middle of dinner, and by the time I had dessert and left, their TV was on. And they had a big giant widescreen, you know, big giant flat screen TV, right? Of course, that's all you guys have ever known, but you know. Like this, like this, right? And they were playing cartoons, um, like Disney cartoons, like um, Little Mermaid type stuff. And there are three or four kids, a couple of them were like grandkids, a couple were kids, nieces, nephews. The whole time I was there, they were watching Little Mermaid or whatever the show was. And when it came time for dinner, they ate dinner watching TV and they never participated. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of find that kind of sad. Don't you? Like, I think there's really a really big strength to sitting around. Didn't we talk about this just the other day about Matthew uh, inviting Jesus? And I said there is a social element to eating just like there is with, it was awkward, remember the word I used? Sex, <laughs> right? There is an intimacy about having dinner with people. And when you sit down, even if it's little kids, you get to tease the little kids and ask them about their little day at elementary school and everything like that. Okay, I'm going way, way down the line here. Let's bring it all the way back to the original meaning of Shabbat. But what had happened was the Pharisees and the religious rulers decided to get legalistic. What is sin on the Shabbat? And people start asking them, what, how do we know if it's sin? And then they discover that like, well, let me just read you what had happened. By Matthew, um, by, the, by Jesus' time, you add sinful nature to some Shabbat rules. And look what Jesus says, uh, Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 to 28. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and that their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In other words, don't power trip people over your legalism. Okay, so let's talk more about legalism. The definition of legalism is dependence on strict adherence to rules and regulations that end up missing the central point. I covered this yesterday. What is the central point? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and love your neighbor as himself. Now, I have a couple little um, illustrations about legalism. Remember the gorilla story I told you guys yesterday? And how after a while, the five gorillas didn't even know what the point of why you weren't allowed to get up on a chair. That's like a classic traditionalism, uh, legalism all rolled into one. There you go. Um, but I've got one for you in my own life where I'm a legalist. So I want to share it with you right now. So here's what happened. I go away to Bible school, just like you are away at Bible school. My roommate at Bible school is a really interesting character. He's an Egyptian. He's actually an Egyptian Baptist pastor from Alexandria. Why is it unusual to have an Egyptian Baptist pastor? <laughs> Guess what percentage of people in Egypt are Christian? 1%. Out of that 1%, Guess what um, percentage of those 1% of Christians are not what we call Coptic or Orthodox Christians? About 5%. So this guy's a total anomaly. Like being a Baptist pastor from Egypt is super bizarre, right? But bless his heart, his name's Philemon, Philemon Dak Duke. He's a full-on legalist, and here's why. He's been raised in a Muslim culture. So we think to ourselves, oh, good for him. He's a Christian living in Egypt. How big a deal is that? Think about it. Everywhere he goes, he's a total minority. 
and Muslims are legalistic like nobody's business. So here's what happens. The first night of me being in Bible school, I'm like, oh, this is so great. I'm in Bible school, and I have a Christian roommate for the first time in my life, right? And so I'm doing my little Christian thing. I'm in bed. I'm reading my Bible. And when I'm done, I take my Bible, and I just place it gently on the floor next to my bed. And Philemon Doc Duke loses his mind. What are you doing? I don't know what. He goes, what are you doing? I don't know. What am I doing? He goes, why? Why would you put your Bible on the floor? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I'll, I'll spare you the whole story. But we, it starts this like week or two week long debate where I'm trying to convince him that there's no rule in the Bible against putting your Bible on the floor. Like the Bible's just paper, right? Now, why was he thinking that it was such a big deal? Yes, have you been listening? He's from a Muslim country. If you put your Koran on the floor, they'd probably put you to death, right? By the way, have you ever been into Borders books and seen the Koran? No? Next time you go into Borders, or they don't have Borders anymore. What do they have? No. Barnes and Nobles. That's about it. Okay. Next time you go into Barnes and Noble, check it out. Where's the Koran? On the bookshelf. It's always at the top. Where's the Bible? Below it. Christians don't care. If you really want to have some fun, take all the Korans off the top shelf, put them on the lower, and put the Bible up. Yeah, just, mon just a monkey with, monkey with the Muslims a little bit, yeah? Right? Right? But here's the funny thing. Okay, let me, let me finish my story, my legalism story. So poor Philemon Dagdu, we get in this argument, I talk about legalism, I talk about faith, I talk about righteousness, I talk about the intent, and the whole time Philemon, Philemon Dagdu, he won't buy it, and this is what he keeps telling me, he goes, this is not just any book, this is God's revelation, it's like God's love letter to you, written since before time began, and he goes this, he goes, if your girlfriend writes you a letter while you're here at Bible college and you take the letter and you, you smell the letter because maybe it smells like your girlfriend, you know, because my girlfriend used to do that. She'd put perfume on her. She denies it, but she did. Yeah. I get her letters and, oh, wow, it smells like my wife now. Yeah. It's the best thing in the past. I know. Yeah. Nobody sends letters anyway. This is like, yeah, this is totally in letter. I, and this is what Philemon Doc Duke says. He goes, would you just take this love letter from your girlfriend and just toss it on the floor? It was a good question. And I was like, no, I guess. He goes, no, no, no. You would place it somewhere because it has value to you. Do you not value God's love letter to you? And guess what happened? Freaking A, he won. Don't ever put my Bible on the floor. People have done that meaning well. They're like at Bible study. And they're like, oh, excuse me, Dane. And I, this has happened. I'm not exaggerating. They've picked up my Bible. And like, I see them put it on the floor. And I go, ah! <laughs> Isn't that funny? I cannot ever put my Bible on the floor ever again. Freaking A, man. Philemon Doc Duke, the legalist, has made me into a legalist. Like, I can't believe it. But it's true. And now, you want to have more fun with legalism? Somebody asked this last night. So, you know, at the church, we have, like, the stage, right? And when I teach on Tuesday nights, I sit on a chair in front of the stage. And behind me, I have my guitar case and my guitar, and I put my Bible on the stage like that. And so this woman asked me last night, she goes, hey, is that not like putting your Bible on the floor? And I go, oh, no. It's legalism, and I've thought it through. As long as I'm sitting here, that's not the floor. But if I get up and I stand on the stage, I, I got to pick up my Bible, because then the stage becomes the floor. That's where we get, let's tie a rope around our house. Yes, yes, Lexi. You see where the Shabbat rules came from? You see how Shabbat rules get started? I got one last one regarding my Bible. It's just kind of stupid, but my friend came up with it because I always make fun of my legalism regarding my Bible, not putting it on the floor. So my one friend, Mike McClellan, he reads his Bible on his iPad. And he says, so Dane, 
If I have my Bible app open, then I can't put my iPad on the floor. But if I close my Bible app, then I can put my iPad on the floor. And I go, yes. <laughs> Legalism, OK? So legalism is just always a lot of fun. But I got a lot of them here for you. So here's a quick little list. And by the way, I'm not looking for answers. I just want to point out the difference between legalism and grace, faith, how we all have what I call the inner Pharisee that's concerned about legalism, right? Alcohol. Oh, there's a good one. Alcohol. Does the Bible forbid drinking alcohol? Some people think it does, by the way, yeah. So uh, we have a rule, no alcohol, like an anchor house, no alcohol on the church property. But the church cabin, eh, the church cabin. People go up and use the church cabin. We kind of have a look. We just don't want to know about it kind of rule, right? Yeah. Um, here's one. This came up one time uh, every year. We, we used to, we still do. We host family camp, right? Back in the day, though, it was all tents. We didn't have cabins. It was up at Camp Nowy up at the YMCA, yeah? And one year, this lovely couple who had been coming to church for a while, and we, they weren't really solid Christians. We were trying to kind of lead them to the faith, and we were all excited. They wanted to come up to family camp, and then somebody said, they're sharing a tent, but they're not married. Uh oh, what do we do? So the next year, we had a rule. If you're not married, separate tents. A oh. little bit of legalism there, huh? How about cigarettes? No rule against cigarettes. But is, wouldn't it be funny? What if this Sunday, I'm preaching this Sunday, wouldn't it be funny after I'm done preaching this Sunday, I walk out to the foyer and spark up a Marlboro? <laughs> and just, just stood there like, thanks for coming. <laughs> Can you imagine? People would lose their minds, right? Legalism, right? Isn't it funny? It's around you more than you think, yeah? Um, here's another one, gambling. Is it allowable by the Bible? What would you say I missed that one? Gambling. Oh. I feel like it says somewhere like it's like a fool that does it, but I don't know where. Right. I agree. Now just so you know, Mr. MacArthur back there, yeah? Even John MacArthur says there's no prohibition against gambling in the Bible. Now, he goes on to say, because you'd expect him to say this, but things that go along with gambling are no good, so it's not a healthy environment. And he's got a point, right? You know, whoop, whoop up in the, in the casino in Vegas. Oh, yes. Yeah? Doesn't someone have to lose Sure. How about the stock market? <laughs> there, there's no end to it. You want to play more fun with legalism, we could just keep going and going, right? And so I'm not sitting here telling you, I'm telling you gambling's legal by the Bible, right? I don't care, right? I'm just, all I'm doing is I'm trying to point out some gray areas to make you guys think a little bit. In fact, it's funny because, you know, my in-laws, after I married my wife, they all moved to Vegas. And so whenever I get home from Vegas, people go, oh, Pastor Dane, where'd you go on your vacation? <laughs> Vegas. <laughs> you know, you just picture Pastor Dane like, woo, come on, five, you know? Like, isn't that just kind of dumb to think about, yeah? Okay, last one, last one. You're going to play in my worship band on Sunday morning. You're going to play in my worship band. I'm leading music, and you're a guy. I'll tell you, wear a collared shirt. I got no reason for it other than I'm a legalist. That's all. That's all I'm going to say. By the way, you can wear a T-shirt. I, I, I would say this. You wear a T-shirt, but I want to look nice. I want you to look nice. I want it to be a clean, pressed good looking. I want you to look like you tried on Sunday morning, right? Is it in the Bible? No. I'm a legalist, right? But what I want you to do right now, because uh, I get an extra few minutes because we started late, is uh, think about yourself. Where are you a legalist? <laughs> what, what would kind of make you kind of go, ah, even though it's not in the Bible? And are you okay with that? Where it really gets weird for a guy like me is when you're the pastor of a church. People come to you and they want you to make a decision. Will we allow this, right? Like it just came up just the other day. Somebody, you know, people drop off groceries at the, uh, at the church kitchen. And somebody texts out to Rick and I, hey, there's groceries in the kitchen, but there's some bottles of wine. Like, what do we do? Like, 
<laughs> there you go. I think uh, Rick said pour it out. I didn't, even, I didn't even bother. I was like, yeah, somebody else deal with this, right? right? <laughs> it's just not right with that wine in it. Yeah, it's true. It's true. OK, questions or comments? Don't ask me to make judicial ru rulings on your own little, little legalisms. But I'm curious if anybody can think of some other, like, maybe gray areas. Sorry, Kate had her hand up first, and then I'll get to you, Trish. Uh, KT, yes. Those were actual laws at the time. But I think I've told you all before, um, when you're in Israel on, from Friday night to Saturday night and you're staying in a hotel and you're on the 10th floor, it's a real pain in the butt because all the buttons are on. You're not allowed to push a button for an elevator on the Shabbat in Israel. So even when you're like in Tel Aviv, which is a very secular part of Israel, it's not, Jerusalem is very religious. Tel Aviv is very secular. I mean, it's kind of funny because here it is, the Shabbat, and you walk into your hotel on a, on a Saturday morning, and you look outside, and there's a gal roller skating in a thong, right? <laughs> but when you walk into the hotel, all the buttons are lit up on the elevator because you're not supposed to push a button on the Shabbat because it might be doing work. And so you wait for the elevator, and when you get in, you just stand there, floor one. Floor two, <laughs> floor three. It's such a nightmare, right? Especially if you're on the 10th floor. That's why good Jews know that you always stay on the lower floors on Shabbat. Only the stupid American Gentiles are up on the 10th floor on Shabbat. And it's such a pain in the butt. You're like, I'm just going to walk. What's that? Some do. Yes, those are the. Go ahead. No, no, it could be Saturday day, Saturday afternoon. Does that make sense? Any, it was anywhere between Friday night and Saturday night. So Shabbat starts at sundown on Friday, and it lasts all Saturday. Shabbat, you know, do you speak Spanish? Saturday. Sabado. Shabbat. 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 Sabbath. 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 Saturday. Yeah. Thank you. Trisha. Are you legalistic about people taking God's name in vain? Yeah. That's a commandment. That's not legal. Yeah, but most languages are wrong. It's like, mm. you have to? Like when I say freaking, is that, should I not say that? Are you okay with that? Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's good. That's good. By the way, I cringe really hard when people take the Lord's name in vain. Like, it just makes me cringe. You know what I call it? It's like a, a cosmic social faux pas. You all know what a social faux pas is, right? No, no a social faux pas would be like, uh, oh, here's a great social faux pas. A social faux pas is, oh my gosh, I didn't know you were expecting. I'm not. <laughs> right? That's called a social faux pas. And you're like, oh, you know, you heard the expression, put, put your foot in the mouth. Putting your foot in your mouth, that's a social faux pas. I think it's the same thing when you take the only name under heaven and earth by which a man might be saved, or a woman might be saved, and you use it as a slang swear word. To me, it's a really cheap way. It's a social faux pas, only it's got like cosmic ramifications, yeah. But I know yeah. what you mean when it comes to other words. Yeah, okay. yeah. Anybody else, question or comment, inner, inner legalist? That was, a good, that was a good one, thank you, Trisha, for sure. Yeah. And what's really interesting, what makes a word a word at all? Mm -hmm. And that gets into the study on uh, cultural language and how things are associated with what. So like a good example is like gay used to mean something very different. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of swear words that people use today used to be commonly used words. And it's just as culture changed, culture started using words in derogatory ways. And that kind of made them stand apart and made them kind of sound bad and used with rough crowds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. More fun with legalism. Here we go. Legalism, yeah, yeah. And when words are kind of created and stuff, and they see how culture reacts to them and how culture takes them, those are the words that are then added to the dictionary. So the English language is constantly changing. Swear words are constantly changing and adapting, and things yeah. become normal, things become not. 
So just so you know, uh, Paul says uh, avoid coarse language. And coarse language in the law of love can be pretty much defined as anything that is coarse language to the weaker brother around you, which is why I don't use the B word anymore. Because I get it, right? I get it, even though it's not a swear word for the culture I'm from. Oh, I once made a very good social faux pas, now that you all know what that is. In South Africa, um, when, um, you know how we say, like, if, if we were driving along here the bypass road and we got two flat tires, and I would say we're really screwed. That, that's not offensive, right, if I say we're screwed now. But what if I use the F-bomb? We're totally, okay, right now? Well, that's how they use the term stuffed. So if you were in South Africa and you got two flat tires and you were speaking with coarse language, you'd say, oh, we're stuffed now, right? So one time I'm at Sunday morning roast lunch after church. Guess what I said? Oh, man, I'm stuffed. And everybody's like, no, 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 no. We don't use that term here. And I was like, what? I didn't know. Isn't that funny? Oh, am I stuffed? Oh, man, everybody's like, ah. Okay, we're out of time. Father God, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you so much for your grace, Lord. Lord, forgive us for our inner legalists, Lord, um, that we seek to control, we seek to shame people, we seek to, per, uh, we seek to appear more righteous than we are, Lord, by, by sticking to maybe some arbitrary man-made rule, Lord. And we've all done it, Lord. Make us aware of it, Lord, and teach us to walk in grace, uh, Teach us to speak the truth, but to speak the truth in love, Lord. And may we be a pe people that are more concerned, Lord, about loving you with all our heart, our strength, our mind, and our soul, than, and loving each other as we would love ourselves than we are with enforcing arbitrary religious rules. May we keep the main thing the main thing, and may we do so to the glory of your name, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, have a great week, you guys. I think we're done.